kings and queens and in-between sinners, saints, and I don't know if I is or I ain't, welcome to another So Random episode of Yes, Jesus! I'm Daniel Francesi, and as always, I'm here with my gifting, lovely bestie, Azariah Southward. So sit down in the pew pew pews and enjoy yourself. It's going to be a great episode. We have Matthew Scott Montgomery with us, because here at Yes, Jesus, we believe... You were made in the image of God, honey. You were born perfect, sis. And God loves you just as you are. God loves with you, the- Azzy. Oh, and Thank God you. love you for getting me that awesome painting. Azzy got me an amazing painting of Jesus that uh, has then again been painted on by a pop artist. And it says, F around and find out. Fuck around and find out about Jesus. <laughs> um, and you're going to today here on the show uh, because... We're going to be talking a lot about Jesus because it's called Yash Jesus. Um, so just sit down for the <laughs> Christianness. Conversion therapy bans are sweeping the globe. France conversion therapy ban. Boom. This national assembly vote was unanimous, one hundred and forty-two to zero. And it includes fines and jail time. So watch out, Franklin Graham. Don't go to France. Or do. The law is written so that LGBTQ advocates can file civil suits on behalf of victims in advance, hailed in Parliament as a breakthrough for people who hesitate or are unable to alert police themselves. Mm. France ain't it, honey, though. Canada. Conversion therapy ban going into effect. Boom. Boom. This new law will prohibit forcing someone to undergo conversion therapy, taking a minor abroad to take part and profiting from promoting or advertising the practice. And if you do, up to five years imprisonment. Yeah, that's right. Canada isn't it either. There's another. The state of Victoria in Australia also passed a conversion therapy ban in 2021. So let's add them to the list. Boom! Boom! And this one also includes fines and jail time. So Ugh, watch yourself. That. Pay up. <laughs> that's it. Let this be your warning to you. Let this be your warning. <laughs> um, that's right. Uh, well, that's good. That's all some good news. So I like hearing some good news. That was a good news news report. Speaking of good news, if you've got some extra good news that you want to hallelujah about, well, just submit it to our praise report. And we will hallelujah along with you. And if you have a little something extra that you want a little push in your prayer, if you want us and our listeners to add you to their prayer list, and so send us a prayer request. Um, So this is the praise report and prayer request section of our show. Uh, Azzy, we got a praise report up top. Yes, this one is from Mitch. Mitch says, I just wanted to say thank you for what you guys do. My praise report is that I'm no longer fighting depression. I lived in the evangelical church for over a decade all while trying to fight against my sexuality. This led to severe depressive episodes. In 2019, I left my church because I was tired of fighting against who God wanted me to be. Now I have a great inclusive church, amazing friends, and my relationship with God has never been stronger. Again, thanks for all that you guys do. Oh, Oh, that's awesome. That is a praise report, Mitch. Um, We're happy to be a small part of your journey. Uh, This is a long journey, and... Um, it's incredible to know that God loves you just as you are. And if you have not heard that today, well, he does, and we do, um, just as you are. So uh, keep on that journey, and we're so happy to hear uh, that you're ha- that you're over your depressive episodes. That's a definite thing to be thankful about. Um, well, we have a prayer request as well. Um, and maybe you could help us, Mitch, adding this to your prayer list. Um, because I believe that you know, the, the greatest way to get the things you want is to be grateful for what you have. So in, in, in the moment of gratitude, we're also going to now reach out and ask that you all pray for this listener. Uh, this one's from our favorite listener that we hear from all the time, Anonymous. <laughs> Anna Anonymous. Um, yeah. We love her. Uh, we, <laughs> uh, you're always, anyone who wants to leave a message at yashjesuspod.com, you don't have to leave your name. You could leave your voice if you'd like. Uh, you can, you know, but we do love hearing your names because we'd love to uh, know who our community is. But if you want to send us an Anonymous uh, letter, you can do that as well. And that's what this listener did. This is a prayer request. Um, The prayer request says, I am searching for a new job after transitioning out of a position that was no longer serving me. It feels like every day I find a position that makes me super excited. Then 
They won't hire me or slash ghost me. I feel disappointed and exhausted. It's such a roller coaster. I've been trying for months and I'm feeling discouraged and fearful for my finances. I just pray that God can use me in this season for something great, even while I am waiting on responses. I have two interviews tomorrow. Um, I hope that God will give me a job I love soon. Um, you know, we will definitely pray for you, Anamos, Anonymous. Um, but I have to tell you that uh, a lot of people are in this position. You are not alone. And you just have to have faith the size of a mustard seed. You know what you're good at. You know what you contribute uh, to a place working there. And they want someone that is good and godly. And I'm telling you that you just stay with it and just keep going. And you're going to find something that felt like you were there all along and was a perfect fit for you. Um, the last thing we want is... You know, a band-aid to stop a broken dam. We we need this to be the thing that helps you your 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 bank account flow and your and find something that makes you feel fulfilled and happy and cared about. So that's we're gonna have a specific prayer, is what I say, Azzy. We should have for Anonymous, we should have a specific prayer that they get something that makes them feel valued and they enjoy. So we're going to like get right down to the nitty gritty and uses their gifts to the best of their ability. So maybe um, I'm, I'm praying for you for those two interviews tomorrow as well. Um, as we, as we say in the Pentecostal church, you know, seek and you shall find knock and the door shall be open to you and name it and claim it, honey. Yes. Name it and claim it. That's like one of my favorite things that they say in the church. The other thing is, and now it's time for coffee and donuts. And tall <laughs> chef. That's like, I'm like, yes, we've made it to lemonade. Um, okay. Uh, we're going to be right back uh, for the lemonade of the day, the scripture of the day after this. All right, we're back. We're back. I'm sorry to subject you to my song, The Scripture of the Day. day. <laughs> scripture of the day. Of the day. Scripture, scripture of, the, of day. the day. It's soul food. That's right. It's soul food. It's food for your soul. It's a scripture of the day, and it's from Jeremiah. Read it to us, Azzy. Jeremiah 29, 11. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Oh, I want to. Read. Sometimes I got to do it as I got to read it again. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. God has a plan for you, and that plan benefits you. That plan is not to harm you. So if someone tells you that God's plan is something that you feel like is harming you, then they are wrong. It says it right there. Throw it right back at them. Uh, we're getting to the meat and potatoes of this episode, and I'm so excited about this one because, look, last week we talked about the film Pray Away and its look mm -hmm. at the leaders who made conversion therapy a thing. And conversion therapy is still a thing that's still going on. Yeah, and after we recorded that episode, I saw such a powerful TikTok from my friend, Matthew Scott Montgomery. Matthew Scott is a fellow actor. I've known him... Uh, for quite some time, but also for, you know him from some iconic Disney Channel roles, especially so random. And I wanted to get to talk to, to him on this show so he could tell us his own story. So let's have him do that. Here he is, y'all. Matthew Scott Montgomery. Welcome. Yay. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. First of all, Ezra, it's so nice to meet you. Um, nice I wish everyone you. could see Azzy's earrings that he's wearing right now because they're so amazing. <laughs> um, and Danny, it's so good. I miss you so much. It's so good to what? see you. I know. You were, you you were one of my very first friends in L.A. when I moved out here, really. And so, like, this is, like, oh. um, I would say full circle. Full circle would make it sound like our lives are over or something. But, like, it's just <laughs> no. it's, good, it's good to see you again. We've only and... just begun. Yeah, we exactly. the beginning. We're... Exactly. Yeah. So thank you so much for but having me. But I have known you quite and... some time. And... Yeah. I do remember uh, young and Matthew Scott Montgomery, and yes. like I had no idea. Like when we, when when our listeners hear your stories today, it's like it's it's going to be wild because I had no idea this was going on, and I was your friend while this was going on. Um, as he, yeah, um, it's you, you have to see like uh, this TikTok video. I know you saw it. Um, yeah, it shows you in some of your pretty iconic Disney Channel roles with a voiceover on the TikTok that tells us. The whole time that you were acting in these iconic roles, you were going to conversion therapy programs. It's yeah. such a powerful video. What made you want to break that silence now, Matthew Scott? Well, it's something that, you know, I, I kind of shoved it down for so long because it's frankly, it felt it felt very embarrassing. You know what I mean? So it's like not something that like I talked about a whole lot. And, you know, honestly, what it was, was David Archuleta posted this thing. 
um, yeah. on his Instagram uh, about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, about him being very. It was like an. It was like a. It was an Instagram live, and it was just a very frank, honest, kind of devastating, um, and incredible and beautiful, um, like hour long venting session he had just talking about his sexuality and there was so much that he said that i identified with and you know he comes from the mormon church and dealing you know dealing with that right. there and it, re it reminded me a lot of myself and my situation and I, I reposted it on my instagram story and i just felt very led in the moment to like have a little caption on the on my instagram post that said like you know as a survivor of conversion therapy i identify with so much this please watch what david has to say and then i got this kind of influx of responses of very close friends of mine and people who were like i didn't know you did that when did you do that and i just felt so led to post it it was this thing where it's like you know i do feel like you know when god speaks to you or you you know something's right or something's not right it was just like this kind of like light went off where i was like i i should share this i i want to share this and so I had this idea of I tr I found my old reel as an actor you have like reels of like all right, your footage yeah. so if you're like when you're auditioning your agents like send out the reel so people can be like oh he can play that he can play that he could be good for this part and I was like I wonder have my old reel from Disney Channel and I found it and I just posted it and just did a voiceover on it it's showing like some really ridiculous I did a lot of really silly stupid stuff on Disney <laughs> Channel so it's like me like in wigs and rolling around in front of a live audience while I'm what sharing What do people approach you about like what are some of the <laughs> Oh um I played this like Australian supermodel um on Disney Channel for a while that like I do a lot of cameos doing that voice really <laughs> over the top kind of stuff I mean it's Disney so it's like Yeah but part of the reason why I wanted to share my story was that like you think you know, but you have no idea, right? So it's like all this like silly stuff that you see on the surface and behind the scenes, you don't you don't know what's happening, you know. And that was something that happened. You know, I was in it for almost uh, I was in for about two years. I was in conversion therapy, and so every day that I had off, and Disney works you very hard. I had a great experience with Disney. It was not Disney who made me go to conversion therapy. It was, Disney had nothing to do with it. Disney was really always lovely to me and extremely supportive of me. And I had a, an incredibly positive experience and hope to work with them again. But every day that I had off, which was either Sunday or Monday, depending on what my schedule was, they were, I worked almost every day for about two years on Disney, which was fantastic. And the days that I had off, I was in Encino going to reparative therapy. Um, yeah. So yeah, another way start? to say how conversion did... therapy. Exactly. Yeah. 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 How did your therapy start? Like what brought like what brought to that? Well, you know, I was over 18. I was I was a legal adult when I I grew up mostly in North Carolina. I went to a private Christian school there. My parents are Southern Baptists, you know, Ooh. insert the rest of the story here. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> when I graduated from school, I moved out to LA and pretty quickly started working. I booked this play Yellow. Do you remember that play, Danny? Yellow. It was at the Coast Playhouse yeah, on Santa yeah. Monica. I remember you coming to the theater. And anyway, um, this I, I was in this play that was kind of my big break, and it, like I ra it ran for a year. And it was a I played a kid who was emotionally and physically abused by his mother for being gay and gets kicked out of the house. And so like. I told my parents back in North Carolina, I was like, I just got cast in my first big role in LA in this play. And they asked what it was about. And I told them and it kind of started this conversation. And my parents came out to visit oh, and we were at the Grove and this really dramatic day at the Grove where it was like raining. The Grove is like a shopping center here in LA. It was me and my parents at a table. The table to the left of us was John Voight and the table to the right of us was Piers Morgan. And we're the only ones in the restaurant. So I'm surrounded by like conservative uh, straight men um, and my parents just kind of asked if I was gay or not or my orientation was the only word my parents could use for a very long time so they're like they were speaking my mom together or your mom was leading or your dad my mom was was leading it she kind of she was like are you questioning your orientation and then the conversation started there and my, my parents were very upset my mom was like crying and like they were not they were they were very unhappy and they left town and then a couple days later, my dad. LA and now he's gay. Like, yeah, yeah. It was like kind of like their Hollywood, worst fear. Right? Yeah. I mean, I grew up in a household where I felt a lot of pressure to be perfect. You know, like any morning that I woke up and was still alive, I was like, oh, no, I'm in trouble. Because like, you know, growing up and like going to a private Christian school and all that stuff, you know, 
you inherently feel like you deserve to be dead just by breathing. Yeah. And so, yeah. and it, I was, it was a very strict kind of household. I was not allowed to get anything lower than a 92. I had a bunch of tutors. You know, we had a rule in my house where it was one sport a year and I had to play sports. And if I didn't make a certain number of points in the games, I was punished kind of things. Oh, so wow. like, this was the environment that I, that I grew up in. And so mm-hmm. very mil- when my military... <laughs> Yeah, and my parents did the best that they thought that they were doing. You know, my dad's, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, he's just, he's a businessman and he's very pragmatic. So it just wasn't a smart business decision for me to be gay. And then my mom was just like <laughs> an emotional wreck about the whole thing. So when my parents came back in town, my dad calls me after I come out, essentially. And he was like, I want to come back in town to get to know you because I feel like you, we don't know you at all. We feel like you've been lying to us your whole life. And so no one asked me why I felt like I had to lie my whole life. I was just in trouble for lying. So, um, so my parents came in town, we got, uh, went to a hotel room. My dad puts a giant stack of research in front of me and was like, being gay is a choice. Here's all the research that I've done. And I've set you up with an appointment for a reparative therapist. And I'm just going to say who this person is, is Dr. Nicolosi, who is in Pray Away, the the documentary. Yes, it was with Dr. Nicolosi. And he was like, I've set you up with an appointment and I think you should go. And was it my decision to go? Technically, yeah. You have your disappointed parents, your mother sobbing in front of you with a stack of research and they're, you know, I just, I just felt like not going wasn't an option because I'm like, are my parents, will my parents even have a relationship with me? Will they even love me at all if I don't go do this thing? So while I'm playing like a 15 year old being kicked out of his house for being gay in a play where I'm literally winning awards, I'm going to conversion therapy for being gay on my days off. And then the Disney channel stuff took off. And so those days for, I I mean, I went, I went into conversion therapy thinking like with my arms crossed being like, I don't believe in any of this. Mm -hmm. And I sat in my first day with my therapy session being like, I think this is BS. Like, I don't believe in any of this. And the place that I went here in LA was specifically designed for actors. Like they kept saying all the time, they were like, my therapist was Dr. Nicolosi's son, who was this very young, young guy who frankly looks and acts like, think David Archuleta. It was really very similar actually. And it was Dr. Nicolosi Jr. And they made a big deal about name a celebrity you can think of, name a single one you see in a movie. They've been through these doors before. We've converted them. We've changed them. They were all gay and they've become straight. And when I went to this therapist, you had to go through like a secret entrance. You had to like, and everyone had like their own like waiting room and they would move you from waiting room to waiting room. So you wouldn't see anyone else who was waiting to go in. And one time I walked in the wrong waiting, walked into the wrong waiting room and got in trouble. They were very upset because I saw another guy there and you're not supposed to like interact with anyone. So for the first, honestly, (laughs) probably like six months to eight months, it was just like quote regular therapy in that, you know, I would just talk about my life and growing up in the South, you shove everything down. So I was never given an opportunity or an outlet to express myself at all. I could get into a whole thing about why I'm an actor and why I have feel the need to express myself. And certain things I did as a little kid were my ways of like kind of acting out and expressing myself. But frankly, for the first six months, it was nice to just speak about my life a little bit to somebody. And then at about like any the therapy, month- even if you're going to like the yeah. ultimate evil doctor, you got to hand yeah. it to your parents. They went straight to like the top of evil doctors. Like. They did. They really did. Honestly, all or nothing. Like, the best of the best for my son. If we're going to brainwash him, we're going to take him <laughs> to the best brainwasher. I, I, exactly. I, I, yeah. J- Joseph, Joseph Nicolosi founded the National Association for Research and Therapy of Homosexuality, which has been an organization behind so many bad and harmful, uh, just bad misinformation, one, about homosexuality. Mm. Um, with through books and conferences, I want to say they maybe even lobbied at one point with lawmakers. Um, but I've known of them for a while, and you honestly got the cream of the crop in evil. <laughs> yeah. Were there any and, of his like practices that were that were abnormal or weird or? or yes. Like, what, so what were some it, of the it, things you went through when you were there? It soon switched. At about eight months in, it switched to being kind of what you're afraid that con- I feel like the stereotype of conversion therapy is. And I started mm-hmm. to have to go to double sessions. So it'd be three hours. Yep. So mm-hmm. I would. Oh, I did too. I did too. Did you? 
Yeah. yeah, I did too. I don't remember the name of mine, but it sounds so familiar to this. When I watched Pray Away, I was like in tears. It looks so similar. Mine wow, was very yeah. psychological, and like mine was like basically the game of my story in conversion therapy was that my mom was too much of an ally, but too much of a person who was promoting what I was going through. So I had to separate oh, wow. myself from my mom, which was my only person who was like, really, truly affirming of anything I did. I mean, if I was oh, a murderer, I love your I mom so like, much. He didn't do so it. Cool. Like, I mean, she's yeah. just like, I can't do no wrong in that woman's eyes. But like, um, Wow. But like, yeah, uh, so that was like mine. But I'm wondering because I've heard so many stories yeah. about him, so, you know, the things with like, you know, hitting pillows with tennis rackets and stuff like, you know, well, and like uh, different things like that. Well, I started to get homework and essentially there's like a textbook and like the audio things I had to listen to at night and stuff like that, which which said that no one is born gay. I was born with a sensitive artistic temperament with an emotionally unavailable father and an emotionally overbearing That's mother. Gay. So when yes yes that's yes yay. <laughs> so um that's like so, that very homosexual feeling when can you like restate that but go that very homosexual feeling when and then say that same thing yeah, i know the homosexual like urge a... <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so you know and and they met it's in pray away as well and at one point i actually told my dad i was like cool so it's your fault because you're emotionally unavailable and i was born with a sense of artistic temperament and oh. whatever and yeah <laughs> and so but then what it turned into was um I had like buzzers attached to my hands, like they would like um, shock my hands essentially, and wow. oh, man. yes, Shocker. and so we would we would talk about like sex or relationships with men, and the whole thing was I have SSA, which is same sex attraction, and I'll never be happy because what I'm looking mm -hmm. for is the love of a straight man, and the only time I'm looking that looking for that is when I'm experiencing shame, and then they show you the Venn diagram of you start to feel upset, then you seek out SSA. So they would like bring up shameful parts of my life and then shock my hands when we would talk wow. about them. So that would like shameful not parts get... that they made you shameful parts that they made you disclose to them. Yeah, all of that yes. stuff is a Tuesday yeah. for Azzy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, at a certain point, I, 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 I read the email the other day out of curiosity. I wrote an email to my dad saying I'm not going anymore. And my parents paid for the whole thing. And uh, my dad asked why. And in a very long email, I explained. And I was very proud of myself. I went back and read Do this. Do you remember what it like, cost? Okay, MSM. Um, I don't Do remember, remember what, it what it cost. However, as, a, as in third grade, I was sent to therapy to learn how to play sports, believe it or not. And I remember that was $116 an hour. Remember that. So I've been to therapy twice. Mine was $300. For... Mine in 1999 or 98 was $300 an hour. And I had to go an hour a week and they upped it to two hours a week. Wow. Wow. What a Mine was free, but it was money, also huh? in a barn. Oh. <laughs> You were in a barn, huh? I was in a beautiful high-rise building in Encino, California, <laughs> overlooking the valley. Yeah, yes. my, I was like in an empty Funded office by building conservative in like Coral Springs. I don't even know. Pompano Beach, something like oh, that. Oh, wait. So, Danny, it was, in, it was in Florida when you went. Yeah, mine was in Florida. Yeah. What okay, happened, got it. I mean, I don't it. want to go through my story. My guy, you know, my guys and my gals on here, they, you know, they know my story. No, I um, basically, I just put myself in. Um, and I did it through my grandmother mm -hmm. who asked the pastor and the pastor was like, I don't really know about this, but this guy came in and gave me this card. Maybe they could help you. And I just kept getting handed off till I, I, I basically my, I landed in conversion therapy like Plinko. Wow. Um, I was like, <laughs> you know, to, like yes. looking for an answer. I wanted to be diagnosed as gay. That's what I wanted, kind of. But okay. instead they tried to change me. And I was like, if this is how I am, I'm supposed to be this way. I, I don't understand. But it did make me have very positive feelings. As a matter of fact, when you and I met, I, I had a boyfriend who was in a play with you. And I, um, yeah. yeah, and we were like, we're roommates for so long to everybody. Like, you know, we kept it. Uh, I was very yeah. positive at that point. Um, but it's so that was still sort of, I think, like residual church hurt, you know, residual hurt from this yeah. kind of stuff, even though I had lived a, an out life in New York City once well, I booked a, a, a studio film i was like that's it i'm going back in the closet so for you I, though you're actually getting your you're going through the very beginning of your career taking off you're you're on the disney channel you're doing play after play after play i know you've worked with like so many incredible uh people uh, but like oh, thanks and then all of a sudden you know um you know you're in you're in therapy and your parents are making you go there yeah, I think as queer kids, we, you know, we have we have survival coping mechanisms to like just get through. And a lot of it right. has to be like duality. I mean, I remember as a kid, 
and I, I wrote this in a play that I put up at once, but like I had two journals growing up, one where I wrote what was actually happening and one where I wrote like oh about God. girls and stuff. And I would leave that one out. And in the real journal, I would cross it all out or tear it up after I, cause I need to express myself, but you like build oh. this like, uh, like multiple personalities because that's how you have to survive. Like, like mm-hmm. I was very, very violently bullied growing up in North Carolina. I did not feel safe there ever at any point. I feel so blessed to live in West Hollywood because, but it's still a thing where anytime I walk into a room, I check all the exits every time I ever any go anywhere. And there's yes. like a, a level of work I have to do when I enter every room to, to undo, like not everyone in this room wants me dead. Okay, I, I can make it through this oh. like next five minutes. And that's like, that's growing up in North Carolina. That's growing that's up as a, a as a That's a huge part kid. of my life theory why gay people are more creative or tend to lean towards creative things because we have to pay yes. attention to detail for survival. Every yeah. time we walk in a room, it's always heteronormative room, you know, especially like a bar yeah. or something. So immediately yeah. all of the normal uh, heteronormative traps of media and advertisement just fall at the wayside mm. to us. Like we might yeah. go, oh, how fun a vintage, yeah. you know, Budweiser gal or something, but we're not yeah. getting aroused or drawn in or hooked by that image. Right. And then that, we're like looking yeah. around and there's, you know, definitely we'll look at some of the hot straight guys, but you don't want to look too much because you might get your ass beat. Mm-hmm. But you, yeah. get, you definitely 100%. notice who's in the room. You notice who might be gay in the room immediately. If we hear immediately. Ah, ha, ha, some sort of effeminate laugh or screech or something, immediately we turn and we spot and we go, okay, I'm cool in this room. You know, and then yeah. after a while we get bored. We might talk to a girl and make a friend, but after a while we're like looking at the drink we're looking at everything else and i think that that's why you know we have attention to detail we notice everything because we spend a lot of 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 time surveying areas for not only safety but just sheer boredom of not being attracted to the the straight male gaze of imagery yeah i uh, i forget where it was said but that queer people get a head start on empathy because we are already born being an other and so we recognize otherness and other people and i identify with Mm. that and you like family knows family kind of thing like Danny, I felt yeah. so safe with you when we met and it was someone that like, I just felt like it was like kind of like an unspoken kind of just safety because it's like you recognize the queerness in other people. And I think that's a lot of why we revere drag queens because they're the superheroes of our community because they they express themselves so fully and take it to like the furthest extreme because it's the exact opposite yes. of the way we were allowed they're to like express man, ourselves as kids. Exactly. Precisely. They're like, a man can't be feminine, so I'm going to be more feminine than a woman. I'll have Trixie Mattel yeah. hair or makeup. I'll, I'll yeah. be this, you know, uh, j- uh, yeah. Jim Bob's big boobs or whatever. I'll do things yeah. that are just so outrageous and exaggerated yeah you know or or be a different you know species of the drag butterfly and be like i'm gonna be hotter than any woman you ever saw like yeah i mean there's all different kinds i i love the, that gender expression and i think it's something that it comes out of rebellion I do too. um yeah and a lot of those people have church hurt you know a lot of the creatives out yes. there we've been through it you know yes they you know it was actually our freaking deacon ross murray that brought to my attention when we were talking about saint francis of Sissy and talking about just about like how um the church is so queered up. I mean, it's why we have velvet curtains and big, huge, you know, stained glass windows and like gowns yeah. and smoking purses like of urns. Like it's yeah. because we've we've made it fabulous. It's, yeah. it's an Italian trope of growing up that you have like five sons and one of them's a priest, you know, like or five daughters and one of them's a nun. Like the gay one always went into the clergy. And so I think that, you know, uh, the thing that, that just really just gets me so angry and the reason we even created this podcast is the fact that there's people out there that think they have to make the choice between gay and God. 100%. Like, and, and, yeah. and, 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 and people telling you that or, or trying to do literal physical harm to you, shocking you or exercising a demon out of you or some kind of you know just stupid uh i just want to say bullshit practice that comes from like years of people worrying about either they're going to be attracted to it somehow which is definitely possible you know there was a study recently that said over 50 percent of women would kiss a woman and i was like Mm. so what you're saying is that the majority of women out there aren't straight you know, yeah. like, I mean, like, it's the same statistic. Like, I just think that there's, you know, people don't realize that the spectrum is long and there's such a fluidity to all of this. And yeah. we're only categorizing things for either dates or to explain to someone who hates. Like, there's no other reason for us to have all these different kinds of, like, category of human being. Unless we right. want to say, this is what I'm into. Are you into this? You know? Yeah. So what is it about what you were going, like, um, 
I can't believe that you went to a program specifically for working actors. Like, yes, mm-hmm. I, I need a little more detail about this kind of organization because if that shit found me, I would have been there. Like, that's what's so horrible about it. Like, I, you know, like because that I, I'm the exact person to go for it. One of the things you touched upon that I thought was interesting is that you get to sh- as an actor, you get to shape shift. Like, I felt as a failure, I failed at being straight. Like, I always was trying to be an overachiever in everything mm-hmm. I did. Almost that I, f- I even failed school and in uh, grades and stuff like that because I was failing at being straight all the time. But mm-hmm. if I played straight as an actor, I was succeeding. And so mm-hmm. to me, it was like kind of like mm-hmm. um, a level of me being like, I can do that. You know what I mean? And I just choose to be authentic. Like it was sort of the, or the battle against my authenticity coming through as a true artist and, a, and an empathetic person. So you're sitting there and you're in a place where like, I mean, actors are in acting schools. I know, um, uh, you know, didn't you study Meisner and some things like that as well? Or am I mistaken? Like some of the um, real I- methody kind of acting? I have studied some of that stuff, yes, and I. That stuff um, is emotional roller coaster type stuff where they make you bring up sense memory and all these other yes. kind of things. So as an actor, we're being torn and pushed around, and then for you to have like actually in your private life, you know, like your inner turmoil and your struggle in your home and your romantic life, and then to have that be played around with in a place that is meant for people that are supposed to move around their emotions a lot. What was that like? Like, what kind of things <laughs> did they have that were actor specific? Well. Um, there wasn't anything that happened in therapy that was necessarily actor specific. It was just part of the glitz and glam of the like appeal to it, I think, where they made you, they yeah. let you know time and time again, you know, no one like espre- expressly said, like, if you want to make it in the industry, you got to be straight. But that was like the subtext of everything kind of where it's like, if you want to have a really big career and we can get into a whole thing. I, I mean, there's hours and hours of podcasts. I talk about how I've been treated as a gay actor and things that agents have said to me or casting directors have said to me. And like, sure, I've talked about that on social media a little bit as well. There's like a whole. I'm so relieved now that we're in a place in 2022 where it's like I'm getting offered things of playing gay characters and the trauma that they experience in the films or television shows has nothing to do with their queerness and sexuality. And that's so attractive to me. I remember one time I was auditioning for something in 2016 and the description was gay, but not a victim. That was the description of the character. And it really upset me because that presupposes that every queer person is a victim and that that's I mean, the defining I mean, I characteristic the of being gay. Is, I would say the majority is in creative narratives. Like, I feel like yeah. every time something is given to us, it's always so sad. Like, oh, it's yes. sad as hell. Like, yes. Um, um, yes. And- me. Yeah, I have like a three strike policy when I'm watching a movie where it's like if there's a gay slur in it or I, at any point I just feel, quote, unsafe watching it. Where like, oh, this movie wasn't made for me. This movie was made for straight people. And if I hit the third strike, then I don't watch the movie or I don't like continue with that because i don't need to watch that for entertainment's sake when it's been my entire life you know what i mean (laughs) but one thing i wanted to say that that we that you mentioned was that um in this tiktok at the end of it i felt led to share the message that god loves you you don't you know if if you're in conversion therapy if you've been in conversion therapy there's nothing wrong with you that needs to change and god loves you exactly how you are and made you on purpose and that's something that i never yes. heard growing up i mean as queer kids we remember literally every single thing that was ever said to us or said to other people we sit and watch or listen to how queerness is referenced we watch it on television when the you know the canned audience laughter what's acceptable to laugh at you know that kind of thing so that's a message i just don't ever remember hearing and i'm so thrilled about this podcast uh, I'm so glad I, I, I'm now a huge fan and a listener and I know that it exists because it's just a message that you just, you never hear that God loves you. It's like, you know, the, the greatest commandment is this, you know, love your neighbor as yourself kind of thing. But like gay people are, Mm -hmm. or queer people are excluded from that completely because they're so below being a human that like, we don't even speak of, of loving them because they're already Mm -hmm. so sinful dirty devils that like they don't even we don't even speak of that kind of thing so it's it, i felt so led to say that that like you know at the end of that message and i got a lot of really incredible responses from people and frankly i'm on cameo a lot of queer kids on cameo reaching out wanting words of encouragement saying they'd never heard anyone say that before and wow. i think that's so important i think that i think that you know i'm kind of preaching to the choir here but like i think I always say that the best students get the hardest lessons, and I think queer kids are the best students. It's my personal belief that God created us on purpose to challenge and teach this heteronormative institutionalized structure that we've somehow found ourselves in. And to God created queer people to challenge that and say, like, do you love your neighbor? This is what I made. 
I, what do you have to, I'm God and I, I made this. You don't think this is beautiful. You should watch what you're saying kind of thing. That's, that's my personal take on it. And that's how I've been able to survive and pull myself out of, you know, the trauma that I've dealt with. And also the gift of being an artist as well, because having the outlet to, outlet to express yourself. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I, I don't think you're necessarily preaching to the choir because we do have some listeners that are in churches where they've stopped saying, you know, bluntly that God doesn't love queers or, you know, they they've become more. Um, oh, I don't know. They're the more to... they're more welcoming instead of affirming. Like they're like, welcome. In. There we go. You're welcome here. Everyone's welcome yeah. here. But they're not like saying your existence matters. Like who right. you are as a person, like unequivocally yes. is loved by God. Like yes. you are good point, Danny. You yeah. are gay, and the, and God made you that way, basically. But they're saying, yeah, hey, the... come in here, give us your pink money, sit down, and have a donut. You know, <laughs> it, it looks yeah. great to have you here. You know, we'd love to yeah. put you in the brochure. Like yeah. you know, it's like that kind of a thing. A lot of schools are having that issue too. You know, where like students are feeling unsafe going into environments I've you know, been dealing with this Wall Street mm-hmm. University thing all you know, the year last year. Like there's a lot of schools out there that just don't um they, they, they don't want to say you're welcome and you can have a safe space and you could be yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. The churches aren't explicitly saying those words anymore, many churches, but they're saying it through their actions by not allowing them par- to participate and to share their gifts uh, in, mm. in that community, um, but by yeah. not being in positions of leadership or just teaching Sunday school even. And uh, so I think even for those people uh, that are still in those spaces, they need to hear that, not just in words that God loves you just as you are and that nothing needs to change about who you are, but also in the actions. So, um, mm, so yes, yeah. thank you for sharing that in your video. And, and we will continue to declare and shout it and scream it here at Yes, Jesus, that God loves you <laughs> yes, God. just as you are, honey. Yes, yes God. Yes. We love you. <laughs> yes. um, what, what got you out of there? What got you out of the program? And, you know, uh, are you still a... a, a a Christian after that experience? Like what what do you believe after that experience? Um, I got myself out. Um, uh, I've kind of had to teach myself pretty much everything that I, whether it's like career or personal life, it's all, it's been kind of me just trusting my natural instincts and self teaching myself. Um, discernment. Yes. Yeah. And just knowing what didn't, feel right. As I said, I, I went back and I read the email that I wrote my dad and I was so frankly proud of myself for the way that I articulated myself and what I said. And I still, I stand by everything that I said. And yes, I still, I still am a Christian. I, um, I was actually asked to leave a church back in 2011 during the same time. There's a church wow. called Ecclesia here in LA. I'm just calling everyone out mm. today. Mm, um, where they were, I remember yeah. there was, <laughs> I Proclaim remember there was one it, day, there, yes, I remember being in church one Sunday morning here in LA and they asked anyone in the congregation if they were a part of the gay community and they said, we're going to lose a lot of people today. I remember them saying that and they asked us to leave and I remember walking wow. up. Yeah, I stood up and I walked out and I was like, wow. How many of um, you? Did you um, go to brunch? I <laughs> um, <laughs> um it was um i wish it was a fun memory like that um <laughs> i know i kind of i, I, I kind of make a little light because you're gonna cry <laughs> you laugh or you cry you know <laughs> well i'm i'm naturally a pretty positive person and i usually lead with humor and lightness and fun so like uh, i'll take any excuse to get it danny i appreciate <laughs> it um i there's a church here in la called church home that i sometimes go to um, they have like an like an app that I do like a daily devotional with and I kind of like I've had to like make my own church kind of in a way where it's like every morning I do like a little devotional and go for a walk. And I think that's very I think it's frankly important for actors. I think it's important for anyone in L.A. or a big city or in 2022 just to have whatever you need to do to get through the day and like center. Um, yeah. I haven't like been to like an actual Sunday morning sit down church in a long time. And I have absolutely no plans to ever go back to North Carolina ever again. Um, that's something that I, I don't wish upon anyone, the, the, what I had to experience there. Um, but yes, I do identify as a Christian and I, I pray all the time. I got Bible verses up around my apartment here. I love that we led with Jeremiah twenty nine eleven today. Um, that one I find very comforting and my personal favorite that was in my, uh, high school yearbook at our private Christian school, we would have like our picture in our favorite Bible verse. 
And mine is Psalm 139, 9 and 10. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. And Mm. that's kind of Mm. for me, it feels like God is reaching through the words and the mess of being alive and just winking and saying like, you know, a lot of this is a joke. I'm in on the joke with you. I, I made this and I got you. And that's the kind of relationship I have with God now where, you know, I feel like I do feel like there is a God. I do. I do believe in Jesus. And I believe that um, it's a God that leads with love and loves and accepts me exactly how I am and and made all of us beautiful queer people exactly on purpose. And I think. I thank God for beautiful boys and drag queens. Yeah. Um, if you're going to have a party, and... you're not going to invite gay people. Your party's going to suck. If you're not exactly. going to have a beauty salon, you're not going to have gay people in there. You're going to have ugly ass people walking out. It's really, it's like, such, it's, if you're going to make people, you better make some gay people. Keep yeah. Them cool. Keep to live funky. a life, to live a life without queerness of any kind or a queer person is a sad life that I would never want to participate in. Because mm-hmm. I frankly do think we are what makes life beautiful in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, we yeah. I think yeah. God dr- created us that way to add beauty, to add differences, you know. Yes. Um, I could get into population whole thing about, control. F- frankly, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we're, and this is something that's – there's nothing new under the sun, right? So it's like indigenous co- cultures across the world have had different genders and different kinds of people and – different names for it and things like that. And I believe that's all a master mm-hmm. plan. And I believe Matthew that Scott, it's, I yeah. absolutely love your queerness. I love your quirkiness. <laughs> oh, I love thanks. watching your, your funny TikToks. I love your love of goosebumps and yes. anything <laughs> spooky. Like I, I love, I love seeing you on there, you know, uh, doing your thing, you know, Oh, thanks, Danny. and, uh, it's, it's just fun to watch. I, I want to ask you about Demi Lovato. Mm. Now, I know that you guys sure. are besties and you've done music videos, reality TV, <laughs> documentary films together. So yes. what kind of support were you getting from them? Well, um, you know, Demi and I both came from the South and we both have been mm-hmm. through a lot. Um, I think Demi's known about the conversion therapy. That's something I was very honest with them about. We've been friends for about the same time that you and I have been, Danny, actually like about 10, 11 years um, we met back in 2011. So, um, you know, Demi's had um, a journey exploring themselves and um, their sexuality and how they identify. They identify as non-binary. And I think we were just supportive. I've always been supportive of each other where we know it's a safe place between the two of us and we can share whatever feelings we have. You know, I don't want to speak for them too much, but like, you know, there are times where Demi would share things with me. I think I'm you know, I think I'm this, or I think I might identify as this, or I've had these feelings. And I'd say, well, I've had these feelings and I went through this and we both know what it's like to have conservative family members and uh, to grow up in like strictly religious environments. And so I think, you know, Demi's one of my greatest support systems and I like to think, and I hope that I am the same for them. And I just want to um, support them in any way that I can. And frankly, any queer person, I mean, whether it's pronoun usage or trans identity or it's coming out of the closet or it's dealing with conversion therapy you know it's up to us like family knows family and we have to like support each mm-hmm. other there has to be like yes jesus is to help people through this stuff because you know 95 percent of what exists in the world is a roadmap for how to succeed if you're a, a straight white man so you know mm-hmm. we have to show each other things can i just tell a really quick fun anecdote the first time that i was i just remember this the first time i was positively reinforced in public for being gay i was still in the closet and i was at a haunted house in san dimas california in a shopping <laughs> it's all making sense now <laughs> in a shopping center i went to this haunted house right i was visiting la i didn't live here yet wanted to move, move out here i was here halloween time i walk into this haunted house in the shopping like this this like busted haunted house like it wasn't like a themed one with ip or anything like that it was just like witch room frankenstein lair you know ghost town it was like every room was just like generic stuff and there was this drag queen witch there was this witch who was this gorgeous drag queen green skin like very giving wizard of oz you know what i mean and she goes (laughs) and like kind of came over to me and was like i and she goes I'm going to scare you straight again. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, I was like this little twink who, like, 
was like, how does she know? How does she know? And I remember she followed me through the haunted house. And before <laughs> she left the haunted house with her long witch nail, she goes, family knows family. And then I walked out. Yeah. And, I, and I remember not wanting to leave this busted haunted house in a shopping oh. uh, strip mall in San Dimas, California, because that drag queen witch saw me for who I was and accepted me and loved me for it. And it was just like, it's like, it was the most like overwhelmingly positive first moment really in my life of being publicly acknowledged for being gay as a great thing. And I just, I, I literally thank God for that drag queen in Sam Demas dressed as a witch. Aww. Family knows family. Family knows family. Was never, it Tim I've Murray by chance? <laughs> but what? <laughs> I, no, was it, was, it, like, was, was it the drag Tim queen Murray? Tim Murray? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, she, no. she loves it. <laughs> oh, I wish. Oh, I, oh, how I wish it had been. Love Tim. <laughs> it might be. You never know. I should tell uh, him that story. Tim, yeah, Tim ends up in green and wigs all the time. Yes, uh, yes, very that. <laughs> that is so such an in- incredible story. I, you know, I've been offended so many times by people calling me out as gay, especially when I was younger. But I don't mm. think I've ever been offended by someone saying family recognizes family. Like I've yeah. had a few people in my life being like, "I'm family," and I knew what they meant, and I felt yeah. safe. Um, yeah. And I, I yeah. maybe that's a lesson for me because I like I don't think I've ever said that word. I always thought of it as an old as old timey, a little bit. But like you know, like when you say that, that kind of opens my heart a little bit. Maybe when I because I do because of you know. Uh, doing shows like this and playing Damien and stuff like that, I get a lot of young kids coming up to me, as I'm sure you do from Disney, like saying, oh, yeah. I saw you and this and that, you know, because representation matters so much. Uh, yeah. But it's nice to be like, your family, you know. So I think yes, that that's I think like a it's, really good way. I think it can be particularly hurtful in my experience when it comes from straight guys, of course, but particularly in my experience growing up, straight women unknown. bullying me. Yes, where like, but there was something about like, I don't know how they pick up on it, but I'll get comments on TikTok and DMs about like, queer kids who were like you were my queer icon on disney channel and i was like i wasn't even like it was a disney channel i wasn't doing anything expressly but you know, gay you know, but like, family recognized family girl and i, they saw you I, on I, channel, like, I love that but is it something it's it's funny it's like we just like we know somehow you know what Mario I mean? it's Cantone like what wasn't i don't know if he was necessarily ever in the closet but he wasn't out of the closet when he did steam pipe uh steam pipe Willie, I'm gonna say this for no Steampipe Andy. I don't know what it was, but he had a character uh, where he was Sounds on like a um, porn channel. I know, <laughs> I know, but it was, it was called Steampipe Alley or something. It does sound like a porn, but he was like kind of like a funny children's show host when he was young in okay. his career on New Jersey tri-state area television. And he'd be like, "Come on, come on, everybody, gotta go across the balance beam, let's go!" And he was like, you yeah. know, doing his Mario Cantone full out shtick. And I knew he was like family. Yeah, you know, yeah, and I think that that's something that's always drawn me to him as a comic too. Is I've always just yeah. remember as a kid seeing that representation and being like, he's allowed to behave that way, and he's the leader, and he's being celebrated, yeah. and yeah, and even if it wasn't like an out and proud thing, it was him just being unequivocally authentic and himself. Right. There's and something we, about we honestly, identifying that, yeah, that feels safe. There's like safety in mm-hmm. that. You know what I mean? Like yes. that's how I describe it. Sometimes I watch, t- like I was saying before, television or movies or certain things that I. I, I feel unsafe in that. I'm like, oh, this wasn't made for me. This was made for another audience, and I should not be watching this, or I will be in trouble. That's like kind of how my brain still works, unfortunately. But like, well, there's something there's about that. If there's a little you like, out there, if there's a little you out there right now, um, this is a safe space. Like, you're listening 100%. now. 100%. Like we, we found and each other. How, we are family. Yes. And, and, like, and I'm so yes. grateful. Like, yeah, I'm glad that um, the algorithm showed you the TikTok, Danny, and that we were able to <laughs> connect on this. Um, and I'm glad it's been able to reach so many people as well because my my social media is a safe place for queer kids for sure. Yes. You know what I well, mean? Thank like, you I, for coming here and being yourself, like just totally, like unequivocally, like and unapologetically you. And we love you. And oh, thank I'm honestly you. I, so I love grateful you. to have you here. I love you too so much. Yeah. Oh, same, what's next same. for you? Tell our, our listeners what's next for you, both professionally and on your faith journey. Well, um, professionally, I wrote a horror movie, a gay horror movie, um, yeah. that we are in pre- we're in pre-production for now that we're shooting in April. Um, Sweet. And I wrote a queer horror movie for myself. I've always wanted to be in a scary movie, so I thought I'd write one. And one of the thrills of writing this movie is, and working on it and developing it is 
It's a queer stalker movie, but all the trauma that the characters go through, like I was saying before, have nothing to do with coming out of the closet or being gay or queerness at all. It's just about a bunch of queer people where scary shit happens to them and it doesn't have anything to do with being gay. Um, so that's like, it's a lot of fun to work on because it's like table reading the script and like locking. We have some really incredible queer actors who I'm such big fans of that I'm so excited we're going to get to work with. Um it's just like it's just a, a celebration of being gay, but the movie has nothing to do with that. It has to do with a stalker, and uh, I'm really thrilled to be working on it. Um, so that's what's well, coming. It's up. fun to have our representation in every genre. We want them all. Um, yeah, <laughs> how, yeah. How, uh, and how about your faith journey? Where are you at with a f- faith journey? I think it's a daily thing. I think something that I mm-hmm. currently, you know, I it's being like it's on my heart to work on is this might sound silly, but like. It's so easy to just forget God exists sometimes because as queer right. people, we've had to like, we've had to be our own cheerleaders and we've had to come up with our own like strategies of how to make it through the day. And a lot of times I forget that anytime I have any of those things come up, I can pray about it or there's a higher being made of love that wants wants to hear about it and wants to take some of that burden from me. So right now in my faith journey, I feel like I'm actively every day trying to not forget and remember to invite God into every single part of my life. And I don't have to take it all on myself because it was God who created me and loves me and wants to know what I'm going through. So that's like actively what I'm working on right now. Yeah. And I think you're like, you mentioned earlier, you go on your walks and, and do your uh, devotions. Those are ways Mm. to, to include and, and see and discover God. Um, Matthew Scott, how can people find you on socials or, um, if you want to give them your address, you can do that too. Oh, sure. It's, um, yeah, on, uh, in my Instagram. Main Street. <laughs> I'm in West Hollywood, somewhere there. Um, I, uh, my, yes, um, no, um, my, uh, my Instagram is Matthew underscore Scott underscore Montgomery. It got a long name, but it's got that blue check. So, you know, it's me. Um, and then my TikTok is Matthew Scott Montgomery. And then my Twitter is kind of funny. My Twitter is I Robot You Jane, which is a Buffy the Vampire Slayer episode title. Matthew Scott Montgomery didn't fit on there. So when I joined Twitter 100 years ago, that's what I was into. So if you want to hear my, read my thoughts, you can head to uh, I Robot You Jane on Twitter or the TikTok that I posted. It's pinned on my um, TikTok page and also my Instagram as well. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, we have a tithe, love offering, charity, act of good to ask of you listeners. Yes, and then we said it last week, but it's still true. Born Perfect is trying to ban conversion therapy throughout the United States, and they need your help and support. Go check them out and give them all your help. They're at bornperfect.org. And uh, Matthew, Scott, would you please join us uh, for the closing prayer? Gladly. Um, we are, everyone, please bow your heads unless you're driving because Jesus can't actually take the wheel. Um, <laughs> Father God, we want to give thanks for your beautiful, made as they are, wonderful servant, Matthew Scott Montgomery, and for his presence in this world and the gift of creation that he is. Uh, we want to thank you that he has shared his story with the world, reaching folks about the dangers and harms of conversion therapy. Please, God, just give him strength, endurance, and joy so that he may continue to be a blessing in this world. And as he said earlier, if you are listening to this prayer right now, and you're here on Yash Jesus, and nobody's ever told you before, you've never heard at your church that God loves you the way you are. We are here collectively to tell you that here at the Yash Jesus family, and we want to say that we, we love you the way you are. Um, Lord, we want to pray for France, for Canada, for Victoria, and for the other 20 states in the United States who have already banned conversion therapy, and we want to keep the momentum of getting rid of that harmful and awful practice going. And we pray for Mitch and his ongoing struggle with depression. And as it, as the joy comes and then like a wave, it, it recedes. We pray that you hold them and comfort them and give them what they need. Uh, we give thanks that he is overcoming it and that he is surrounding himself with good people and a good church. Mm-hmm. Keep his relationship with you strong. Make yourself known in his life and give him that queer joy. And for anonymous listener, we pray for you who is still searching for a job like so many. Let them get a job where they can feel valued and are contributing 
what they need to in this world and a job that they can enjoy. Yes, we thank you, God, for all of our listeners. We thank you for the opportunity to be free to get together and uh, just lift you up and just thank God that we ended up where we ended up with you still by our side. In your holy and precious name, amen. Uh, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, boys. I appreciate this. This was great. Um, this was just with the little soup that we needed for the soul uh, back, oh, back yeah. way back yes. when. And we hope that this message is reaching you at home. Um, and we thank you for joining us and, and listening to another episode of Yas Jesus. You can find us on social media at Yas Jesus Pod or on our website at YasJesusPod.com. Now, if you like the show, please consider becoming a monthly sponsor. What's it going to mm-hmm. take to get you into these gay Christians? You can find a link to do so <laughs> in the show notes. If you haven't yet, uh, please leave us a review or share us with a friend. Doing so helps us reach new people and uh, keeps Azzy's wig bill running. <laughs> and if you become a sponsor i'll share my alt twitter honey i gave it away earlier today to a sponsor <laughs> you can now leave an Ooh, audio prayer oh, request no. or praise report on our website yes jesuspod.com we would love to share your voice and your prayers on the show so drop us a line or send us a recording on yes jesuspod.com send us your praise reports your prayer request episode ideas guest ideas or even just a Family knows family. <laughs> uh, we would love to hear from you. Yash Jesus is hosted by me, Danny Francesi, and my bestie. Azariah Southworth. Music, sound, editing, and all things audio are done by Chris Heckman. Our show is produced by the Freak and Deke and Ross Murray and Meredith Polly. Special thanks to Sophie Serrano and Sam Ispin. Yas Jesus is brought to you by Oddity. Oddity execs are Ryan Lochner, Jessica Bustilios, and Steve Michaels. We are streaming and screaming family on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your gay-ass podcasts. And Matthew Scott, you're welcome to say this with me because we're going to say it one more time. God loves you just as you are. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. Amen. So keep praising the Lord, y'all. See you next time.